I can start the webinar, right? You have to, okay. No one. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking on the traditional lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. This is a time of the Nugun, Nugununji, when it's cool but getting warmer and an important ceremonial time for the Darawals, which begins with the appearance of the splashes of the bright red Waratah in the bushland. I acknowledge the elders who are caring for those lands and pay respects to the old ones who have come before and the young ones who will follow. I also extend that respect to Indigenous people joining us today. My name is Jazz Chambers and I'm delighted to be chairing this meeting and I welcome you on behalf of my Ocean Decade Australia co-founders Karen Evans and Kim Picard. Thank you for the gift of your time and attention. We've got a great lineup of speakers today and we will all learn a lot together. Before we begin, a couple of necessary housekeeping points. We are recording today's session and it will be available after the event. We have over 300 people registered today, so we have disabled the chat function, but you are able to ask questions when using the Q&A feature in the Zoom toolbar. We'll be taking questions throughout the event and our moderators will answer them if they can and reserve the ones for our panelists for later in the event. You are able to upvote questions that you would like answered. We will also run two lightning quick polls. These are a short and snappy survey we'll, and we will provide 90 seconds to respond. Your responses are anonymous and we will share the results immediately after we close the poll. We now have a word of welcome from Ariel Troisi, Chair of the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. Convenience of this event, Ocean Decade Australia, and congratulate them for the hard work and for this initiative. As we all know, the ocean faces multiple challenges. And through this UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, we have an opportunity to transform the way we relate to the ocean, setting solid grounds for this future relationship for the de decades and generations to come. This is actually the main topic of your discussions today behavior and action, the change for a new blue deal between humans and the ocean. Today, we have a list of speakers that is an impressive group of experienced and knowledgeable professionals from different disciplines dealing with clean energies, uh, biodiversity, sustainable food production, behavioral uh, psychology. I will be looking forward to hearing the results of your discussion. Because as I said, for setting the solid grounds, looking to our future, we need to be bold, we need to be creative, we need to be proactive. And you in Australia, you're setting an example that will be replicated in our regions of our world. I thank you once again for giving me the opportunity to join you today and wish you all success in your discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel, for those warm words of encouragement. And we congratulate you, Vladimir Rybin, and, and the Ocean Decade Coordination Unit at UNESCO IOC for your work thus far. The University of Western Australia Oceans Institute had generously offered to be our host for this event, which is not eventuated. We look forward to being the beneficiaries of their hospitality another time. We do wish to highlight the seminal role that research institutes bring to the ocean conversation. In Australia, we are very lucky to have a number of them around our country. They are critically important innovators and connectors of scientists and researchers, educators, communities, business and government. We welcome Julian Partridge to the stage to say a few words, Julian. Thank you for that introduction, Jazz. I'm here from the University of Western Australia's Oceans Institute, and as a strong supporter of Ocean Decade Australia and its work in this UN Decade of Ocean Science. I hope to course that I'd be welcoming you to Perth in person, but that hasn't proved possible. Instead, I welcome you virtually to Perth, and I acknowledge that I am on the lands of the Wajak Nola and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. As director of the UWA's Oceans Institute, I had the great privilege of working with more than 200 highly qualified marine researchers, all of whom are working in marine research in some way, be it in marine biology, chemistry, oceanography, engineering, law, economics, business, or other discipline. Together, we're a powerful team. Australia-wide, 
marine researchers collectively constitute an even more powerful team. In fact, Australia can boast, boast world-class multidisciplinary marine research. Conducted by people spread across universities, research institutes like mine, the PFRA, CSRO and AIMS, or her work are working in state and federal government departments, and of course in industry. We also have some very strong structures, such as the National Marine Science Committee that produces Australia's National Marine Science Plan that helps guide marine research priorities. And as a country, we're lucky in having such marine research strength because this is needed to produce the hard facts that are essential for evidence-based decision-making about the oceans. This is the information that's needed by policymakers, regulators, governments, and industry. And this is the evidence needed to underpin our management and government governance of Australia's vast uh, ocean estate, as well as the world's oceans more broadly. Nevertheless, as a marine scientist and as someone whose job it is to enhance, expand and direct marine research endeavour in my institutional position, I can tell you with complete certainty that the future of the oceans depends not just on marine research, but on a multiplicity of other stakeholders. If oceans are to be healthy in the future, we need engagement of many elements of society, individuals, communities, industries, NGOs, regulators and all levels of government. Pulling together, we can tackle the many challenges facing the oceans, be that increasing sea level temperatures, rising sea levels, more frequent storm events, overfishing, plastic pollution, or the numerous other pressures faced by the marine environment. To do this, we need new ideas and new enterprises, including new blue economy industries, led by a diversity of thought leaders who will challenge the way we do things now and suggest better ways for humans to interact with the oceans in future. Properly engaged and working together, I'm positive that we can face these challenges and guide society towards outcomes in which the oceans are healthy and protected and where they sustainably provide the many ecosystem benefits and economic benefits on which we all rely. I wish you well for today's event. Enjoy, learn, participate, engage and take action together for a better ocean future. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. The first year of the Ocean Decade has been a year of great change, the result of an evolving and sharpening public discourse regarding climate and the environment. And we will all watch with interest in the coming weeks, the discussions at the COP26 in Glasgow. Many of you who join us today know a lot about the ocean. You've studied, lived, worked in or on it. And I imagine most of you have been to the ocean and like me could not imagine not having had the privilege of its physical presence in your life. So many of you will likely know these ocean facts that are up on the slide and the critical role the ocean has in sustaining life on Earth. But as a nation, how ocean literate are we? Humans actually know more about the surface, the contours of Mars, than we do about our own planet. As a species, we have made that investment decision over many decades. One of my co-founders, Kim Picard, is the lead of Oz Seabed, our national program to map the sea floor. I don't know anyone who knows more about this than her, and I'm reliably informed that globally, we only know about 20% of what lies under the surface. That's a lot of unexplored, unknown territory and a lot of opportunity. While we love that Australia has a space agency and we're planning to go to the moon, I am ever curious as to why we do not have an ocean one. To make a case for such an idea, we need to know what is happening and employing the Ocean Decade framework is helping us to organise our understanding of ocean, ocean action in Australia. So what is this UN Ocean Decade? You may be aware that the UN declares decades of on topics of global importance and there are nine international decades currently being observed by the UN. At Ocean Decade Australia, we view this decade as a platform opportunity for collaboration, partnership, learning, action, and critically investment for a sustainable ocean future for Australia. Good ideas get us only so far. We believe that we need an organizing principle, a way of gathering knowledge, using it to address problems, and then seeing if in doing that, we've made a difference. And this is where the Ocean Decade framework proves useful. We're going to use the framework today and relate the ocean stories you're going to hear from our pitching team to demonstrate how it organises information. The framework was invented by a global community. Thousands of people meeting for three years developed this roadmap to get us from the ocean that we have to the ocean that we want amongst the many Australians. 
the three objectives in the center there are all about knowledge, identifying the knowledge required, generating it, and then using it. I was fortunate to co-present at a conference recently with Harry Bridal, a national treasure when it comes to ocean literacy. That is understanding the ocean's influence on you and your influence on the ocean. The objectives in the center can holistically be described as an objective to raise ocean literacy. The present set, set of 10 challenges, noting that they could change in the course of a decade, include mapping sources of pollution and contamination, figuring out how we sustainably feed the world's population, or how we enhance multi-hazard early warning services to prepare communities for natural disasters such as tsunami. Finally, the framework outlines seven outcomes. When you registered for this event, we asked you to prioritise the outcomes and 77.5% of you nominated a healthy and resilient ocean. It's important to note that a framework like this does not set targets for nations. It would not be appropriate to, to expect the same from, for example, Samoa as the United States or Australia. But it does provide a roadmap and mechanisms for contributions from all ocean stakeholders to be counted towards a global effort. And indeed, anyone can be a contributor towards those outcomes by taking action. At the bottom of the framework, you can see the decade actions and the types of them, programs, projects, activities, contributions. We will be hosting webinars in November to outline how you can apply to have your actions endorsed by the Ocean Decade. Today, though, you're here to listen to seven ocean leaders, people who are taking action now, and we have asked them to explain their stories in the form of pitches. I hand over to Lucy Buxton, our moderator for today's pitch session. Lucy leads industry engagement for the C3 Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney, and has generously volunteered her time to all three of our stakeholder briefings this year. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Jazz, and welcome to all of our online audience today. My name is Lucy Buxton, and I have the pleasure of facilitating the next session, Australian Action for Ocean. Now, as we heard from those open comments, taking action to change the status quo can seem at times overwhelming, exciting, and pioneering. And today we're delighted to be joined by seven ocean leaders and sea changers to tell us their stories, pitch style, and explore the science of behavior change and what it takes to make it stick. We have heard from you, our audience, through the stakeholder surveys that have been sent out after these events. Those results have shown that you want to understand more about how your collective actions can map against the UN ocean Ocean Decade Framework. So using our speakers pitches today, we will illustrate how their initiatives can support the decade objectives, challenges and outcomes. We hope that this in turn helps support you, our audience, on how your collective leadership and initiatives can support the objectives of the decade. Just a reminder that please feel free to submit your Q&A through the function. Those will be fielded at a later session shared with by Juliet. Um, following the pitches today, we will have a lightning poll. We'll have 90 seconds and looking for your quick and immediate gut responses to what you've heard, please. So without further ado, let's get on to our first speaker. We're joined today by Alex Ogg. Alex combines his passion for our oceans with his extensive network in the aquaculture and energy sectors to bring ocean renewables to the fore as a mainstream contributor to Australia's decarbonisation journey. Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lucy. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. And like Julian, I'm proud to be speaking from Wajak Noongar land. Just a quick thought provoker to get us started. Does anyone remember where solar power sat on the energy spectrum in 1980? Unfortunately, I do. It's now October 2021, and you'd have to be frozen in time like Utsi the Iceman to avoid the relentless media bombardment over today's three C words. <laughs> That's COVID and climate change. And in terms of climate change, 
The IEA's World Energy Outlook 2021 states that half the emissions reductions we need to meet the Paris targets by 2050 will come from technologies currently at demonstration or prototype phase. Well, our government seems complacent that we have solar, wind, and hydro energy all under control, and all these showing steady growth and underpinning the new energy poster child that's green hydrogen. But what are the clean, stable, and predictable power source that lies on the doorstep of 80% of Australia's population living on our coastlines? Energy produced from wave and tides can provide over 20% of Australia's energy needs by 2050. And this technology is already being prototyped. And yet, with rare exception, Australia's world-class wave and tidal resource is virtually invisible. Just like solar energy in 1980, wind generation in the 90s, green hydrogen the year before last. So, unlike, so like an unknown crooner from the back of Burke on a new season of The Voice, Ocean energy needs a catalyst, a disruptive element to propel it into the Australian agenda and onto the global stage. Well, as part of a collaborative partnership, the Australian Ocean Energy Group is organizing the means for that disruption. Without having Guy Sebastian in our tent, we'd actually rather get Russell Reichelt to Sherpa us up to the attention of the ocean panel, to assist them to achieve one of their 2030 aims, being that ocean-based renewable energy is fast growing and on the path to becoming a leading source of energy for the world. And so I introduce you to the integrated ocean energy marketplace, a world's first resource, which combines wave, wind and solar and tidal energy into an integrated energy ecosystem with local microgrid distribution at its core. And we call it a marketplace as it's a forum for bilateral transactions to match developing ocean energy technology to energy markets hungry for clean energy transition. We see the logical starting point within the diesel-fueled blue economy sector. Now the marketplace will provide a place for learning and knowledge transfer, both digital and physical, with access to a multimodal marine energy system, building critical market and public awareness. There, oceanic energy customers looking for clean solutions can tap into the rich marketplace data to model, design, and construct commercial integrated systems optimized to their needs with a clear understanding of the risks, costs, and benefits wave and tidal power can contribute to other offshore renewables like wind energy. And we're confident with the right levels of support that the marketplace will change the tide for energy markets, for policymakers, and for investors. But to achieve our 2050 targets, Australia needs to put ocean energy firmly on the roadmap today, beside wind, solar, and hydro, and as a means of producing green hydrogen as a mainstay of Australia's zero emissions future. And so we urge governments, industries, and impact-focused stakeholders to join us in this endeavor. The stakes have never been higher. I invite you to be a part of this unique solution. Thanks. Great to be here and kick this discussion off. Back to you, Lucy. Fantastic, Alex. Thank you so much. Uh, really exciting project. And yes, absolutely, we need to get this on the voice equivalent with all of these decision makers. So audience, just as we spoke about at the beginning, um, Alex's presentation and his initiative, we've now mapped against the Ocean Decade Framework. And you can see here that his um, actions are contributing to outcome three. Um, and when we put that against the um, Ocean Decade Framework, you can see here how collectively that initiative is supporting different outcomes under the, um, under the framework. Now, we're not going to do this for every single speaker. This was just an example with Alex's um, so that we can help you understand um, mapping. Uh, for the rest of the speakers, we're only going to just highlight their objectives and then summarize at the end. So on to our next speaker. Very excited to welcome Heidi Tate from Tar Tarango Blue. Heidi's always been an avid lover of nature and outdoors. 
So when she was working as a scuba instructor and started finding rubbish everywhere, her only option was to act. In 2004, Haiti founded Tangaroa Blue Foundation as a way of addressing the ever increasing threat of marine debris in our oceans. Haiti, over to you. Thanks, Lucy, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I'm joining you from Gia and Nauru country up in the Brit Sundays um, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So the amount of plastics and rubbish in our oceans is now undisputable. Somewhere in excess of 13 million tonnes a year, depending on which research that you read, ends up in our oceans. But I would argue that we probably don't know exactly, as this is based on a whole heap of estimates and extrapolation of numbers. And in reality, it is probably a lot worse. When Tangaroa Blue Foundation was founded in 2004, people actually thought that we were talking about driftwood when we were talking about marine debris. Now, thankfully, global awareness on this issue is significantly higher today than back then. And we even have a sustainable development goal target for marine debris. And current discussions around a global treaty on plastic pollution are encouraging. But how does that translate to the individuals who pick up rubbish at their local beach every day when they go for a walk with their dog? Tangaroa Blue created a holistic framework to connect those individuals, local community groups and citizen scientists to actions that focus on two things. First of all, removing the mountains of rubbish in our environment, and then more importantly, to provide evidence that would push for changes in their communities, government policies and industry practices that would ultimately stop the flow of rubbish into our oceans in the first place. Our mantra is, if all we do is clean up, that's all we'll ever do. So I'd like to present to you our solution, the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. So the AMD framework um, connects all parts of the marine debris chain in a strategic and an integrated way. We start off with cleanups, and this originally was on coastlines and beaches, but now it's along any pathway that transports litter to the ocean, including rivers, creeks, stormwater drains, beaches, and islands. Then the debris is sorted into 140 odd categories that help identify the source. And that includes recording things like material type, the item type, and even details like barcodes, brands, and serial numbers that can help us track to the source. Submission of data into the Australian Marine Debris Initiative data base is just about to kick over 20 million data points from 25,000 cleanups across Australia, and more importantly, with the collaboration of over 2,000 partner organisations. The data is then used to track back to the source wherever possible. And once we know where it's coming from, then we can identify which stakeholders we need to bring to the table to develop and implement strategic source reduction plans that intercept these items before they're released into the environment in the first place. Then most importantly, we need to monitor the impact to ensure that we have stopped the flow at the source. So then the cycle continues. Now these steps connect with addressing marine debris in a scalable model from local community efforts through to state and national government policies and plans, industry best practice, and even through to a global initiative. I just wanted to share a couple of case studies on uh, how we've used this framework to stop at the source. And the first one is around shifting the single-use plastic economy at the Big Blues Fest Music Festival back in 2019. So working with our Australian Marine Debris Initiative partner called We Refill, the Blues Fest organisers and our friend musician Jack Johnson, the Global BYO Bottle Campaign was launched. This event reduced 24,000 single-use water bottles across the whole of the back of house by replacing the Coke and Mount Franklin water bottle sponsorship with 18 water refill stations across the site. And this provided chilled, filtered and sparkling water refills for not only the four or five days of the festival, but in the weeks of uh, building the festival site and also the pack down. The second case study is a community project that we were involved in called Better Buds. And this was working with the community in Warrnambool in Victoria to stop the flow of single use plastic cotton bud sticks from being flushed down the toilet. Yes. People do that. Now, these are actually quite slim and they slip through the water treatment plan and directly into the ocean. And the community collected over 20,000 cotton bud sticks from one small beach near the plant over two years. Now, through working with the plant and with the community, we've seen a significant reduction through behaviour change from the community and also plastic stems being replaced to bamboo and cardboard in products sold not only in Warrnambool in Victoria, 
but now nationally. Up in Cape York in 2016, we discovered a new water bottle brand that we'd never seen before in Cape York. And when we record the barcodes, we kind of get an understanding of what's normal up there. One year, we found hundreds of new brands that looked like uh, they'd washed up just being used that day. We reported this through to our framework at the Department of Biosecurity um, and Agriculture, and they for, uh, forwarded this information onto Border Force. This actually led to illegal fishing vessels being captured in the Coral Sea from Vietnam, just by recording that extra detail of data around barcodes. And the last one is around Ditch the Flick. So this is a new project that we've been working on in the Great Barrier Reef project, uh, and working with the Townsville Stadium, uh, we were able to reduce cigarette butt litter by 71% over six NRL games this year. So it shows by taking data that's collected by citizen scientists, we can then identify the sources and the stakeholders that we need to bring to the table to implement these source reduction projects. But more importantly, it's critical that we continue to monitor to make sure that the impact of what we want is actually being achieved. So thanks so much for letting me uh, introduce this program to you and on to the next speaker. Thank you so much, Heidi. Wow, I am absolutely blown away. 20 million data points and 2,000 partners. That is absolutely fantastic. So let me just click through to our next slide and introduce our next speaker. Before we do that, we can see here how Heidi's presentation maps against the Ocean Decade Framework project, uh, outcomes, outcome one, um, add two. So on to our next fantastic speaker, and I'm delighted to introduce Martin Excel. Martin has been in various roles in the seafood sector for over 40 years and with Austral Fisheries since 1997. He's also the managing director of CBOS, that's Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship, which is a collaborative venture between the 10 of the world's largest seafood businesses and a collection of international scientists from universities around the world. To learn more about his action, I welcome Martin. Thanks, Lucy, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the, the problem we're seeking to address at CBOS is how to achieve a global transformation to have sustainable seafood production and a healthy ocean. The Ocean Panel Report identified key problem areas, including uh, poor management of ocean assets, declining ocean health, uh, increasing climate-induced impacts on the ocean and society. But they also identified solutions. And if I quote uh, from their actual executive summary, they said, new partnerships need to be forged that will take action now to achieve a sustainable ocean and a sustainable future. And the UN Decade also identifies that innovative partnerships are essential for success. CBOS is one of those new partnerships. It's, it's unique, it's a cross-sector collaboration between 10 of the largest seafood businesses in the world and dozens of scientists across disciplines and universities. But it's not just a, a gathering of those scientists and industry members. There are actual scientific theories and a hypothesis behind the approach. The first theory is of keystone actors. And that's, that's based on work from uh, Robert T. Payne around keystone species, which demonstrated how some species exert a much stronger influence in an ecosystem than others. The second underlying theory is the diffusion of innovation. Uh, that was developed by E.M. Rogers, and that explains how over time, an idea or a product gains momentum and, and diffuses or, or spreads through a specific population or social system. And the hypothesis, the science hypothesis behind CBOS is to see if leadership by these keystone actors can result in cascading effects throughout the entire seafood industry and enable that critical transition towards improved management of marine living resources and our ecosystems. 
key to its success, though, are people. CBOS is a gathering, not just of 10 corporations, but actually of 10 people, the CEOs and presidents of those corporations who are the key state actors. Their aim is to establish and implement science-based solutions in real-world situations at scale. So if those CEOs are going in a particular direction, they do so as leaders of corporations who generate more than 10% of the global seafood production. They're innovators and early adopters, which means their actions can establish a pathway to achieving that global transformation. There's heaps of actions they're taking. Just for now, though, an example is their work to eliminate IEU fishing and forced labour, which are sadly endemic throughout the seafood sector. CBOS are working with multiple groups to continue assessing and reducing the risks of that IEU fishing and forced labour from being in their own operations or their supply chains. They've developed science-based solutions, including a global map of IEU fishing and forced labour risks at port, at sea, and associated with transshipment. They've created an electronic monitoring and, and used novel technologies to extend traceability. A toolkit of policies and procedures that can be used and voluntary procurement actions for their companies purchasing seafood. I look forward to expanding on these and other topics as we go through this panel session today. And quite frankly, CBOS is an exciting venture for our ocean, our planet, and I'm super proud and uh, pleased to be here and be part of it. Thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you, Martin. And what an incredible example of how leadership and partnership across sectors can create such incredible change. So if we look at those objectives from Martin's presentation against the Ocean Decade Framework, we can see here that his actions are contributing to objective three, a productive ocean. So on to our next speaker, very excited to invite Erin. Erin is the Chief Development Officer of Australia's first offshore wind project, the Star of the South which seeks to harness the Bass Strait winds to power more than a million homes with clean energy while creating thousands of jobs. To learn more, I welcome Erin. Thank you, Lucy, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to join you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people here today. I acknowledge them as the trad traditional custodians and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Now there's a lot of doom and gloom when it comes to climate and energy talks these days. Sure, there are challenges, but as Albert Einstein once said, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Our energy system here in Australia is at a turning point. More than 60% of our generation in 2020 came from coal-fired power stations. Many of them still have years left to run, but it's also widely known that these facilities will come to the end of their technical lives over the coming decades. So we need new power sources to offset their loss. And that's why we at Star of the South have a mission to build Australia's first offshore wind farm. Now I'm talking with an ocean crowd here, so I'm sure I don't need to tell you that it is very windy out at sea. Our Bass Strait winds offer an enormous opportunity to harness a new, clean, consistent and reliable power source while creating jobs and investment in regional communities. I am extremely optimistic about the future of offshore wind in this country. Just today, the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill, a new regulatory framework for enabling this sector, is due to be debated in our federal parliament after already receiving bipartisan support to be enacted as soon as possible. We are blazing a trail with Star of the South there are many small steps along the way, but we're starting to take some giant strides. Of course, we need to do it in the right way. And that's why we have gathered a team of global specialists, some of which you can see on the slide here, which we're combining with local know-how to ensure that Australia's first offshore wind project is built in a sustainable and a respectful way. Respectful of our ocean and the unique environment and respectful of other users of the sea. And that's part of setting up this new industry. 
People say it takes a village to raise a family. Well, it certainly takes a few villages to build Australia's first offshore wind project. Some of the photos and organisations that you see listed on this slide are part of that journey with us, from our regional staff out in Gippsland to our friend Tony Wolf here in the hard hat, a current coal worker and a huge supporter of offshore wind, as well as a host of companies, researchers and scientists who are also with us on this journey. So my message to you today is to get involved, follow our social channels on LinkedIn and Facebook and sign up to our supporter list at starofthesouth.com.au. We still have a long way to go, but it is moments like this and today that we can create movements. So please join us as we continue on this very exciting journey. Erin, thank you so much. Fantastic presentation and really exciting to see there how you've built those relationships with your uh, local stakeholders as well as cross business and research. So just looking at um, Erin's actions, we can see here um, that these map to the framework outcomes. Outcome three, a productive ocean. So I'm now delighted to invite Ben Milligan to the stage. Dr. Ben Milligan is the Director of Global Ocean Accounts Partnership Secretariat, currently hosted by the University of New South Wales. Ben's focus is on the issue, sorry, is on the use of environmental information in public policy making. To learn more, I hand over to Ben. Thanks so much, Lucy, and uh, great to be in touch with everyone, albeit virtually. Um, so let me talk a little bit first about the problem that the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership is, is trying to tackle. Um, and it's quite different to the ones that you've heard compelling presentations on previously. It's well known that oceans and coasts provide a wide range of benefits. They're foundations of our well-being and prosperity that billions of people rely on around the world. And we're increasingly looking to oceans for all kinds of new opportunities. Uh, we just heard a lot about renewable energy. We could add to that list new raw materials, medicines, biotechnology, and many others. The critical challenge is that many of these benefits and opportunities provided by ocean ecology in particular are being missed or lost through pollution, overfishing, climate change, habitat destruction and, and many other well-known pressures, uh, especially amongst this circle of ocean specialists. One of the neglected drivers of this challenge is that many large scale decision-making processes, whether that's in the government or the private sector, are optimized to achieve quite a narrow range of outcomes. So in the case of government policy, there's a really strong uh, preference for optimizing GDP growth in macroeconomic planning related to oceans or generally. And these processes just don't account for the values of the ocean broadly defined. Uh, information about the ocean is growing rapidly and its importance, but it's very, very specialized. It's isolated in individual expert communities and companies and if we're going to change how we manage the oceans at large scale, we need decision-making processes that are informed by, by the bigger picture. And, and that's really where ocean accounts come in. So ocean accounts are coherent sets of ocean-related data across a broad range of domains, environmental, social, and economic. Uh, so that's their structure. The other key word here is standards. So they are organized in a special way, a way that it's consistent with the international accounting standards that are already used by governments to measure performance of the economy. So when we read about GDP on the news, for example, each quarter, that's the product of an entire methodological exercise that has been tried and tested over many decades. Um, but it, it just doesn't cover the asset base that drives our long-term prosperity by design. And so we need to expand the scope of our national accounting processes if we're going to be really serious about creating the policy and other change that we need for a sustainable ocean. Um, so ocean accounts are designed conceptually to answer three broad groups of questions. We still need to know about ocean growth. That's really important. But we also need to know about who's benefiting from ocean growth. Is it some groups of people and not others? Do we have equity issues? And 
critically, how sustainable is the ocean economy? And in accounting terms, one way of putting that is, what is our asset, asset balance sheet for the ocean broadly defined, including the critical step of recognizing ecosystems, the environment, as our most important asset for long-term prosperity. So that's what ocean accounts are. It requires, to build them, it requires a lot of collaboration, a lot of unusual collaboration across disciplines that don't normally work together. And that's what the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership is really designed to do. So it's a voluntary partnership uh, of national governments, international institutions, universities, and increasingly representative groups from the private sector, all of the organizations who are members are committed to supporting the implementation and scaling of ocean accounting to transform measurement and management of progress towards sustainable ocean development. That's the closest thing we have to a mission statement. Uh, we're very new, established in 2019, uh, but growing quickly. So the, the GOAP membership is currently supporting pilot and implementation processes in more than 15 countries. Most recently, a um, ministerial workshop in Indonesia is doing just incredible things within its finance ministry to transform how they account for the value of the ocean. So um, if you're interested to learn more, look at www.oceanaccounts.org and um, supported by some of our um, governmental members, in particular, the UK's Blue Planet Fund, uh, the World Bank and the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. We're hosting a whole range of awareness raising and practical collaboration events over the coming year. So uh, we look forward to keeping everyone updated in the Australian Ocean community and beyond. Thanks very much, Lucy, I'll hand back to you. Thank you so much, Ben. What an important topic. If we don't understand the value of our oceans, where would we be? Thank you very much. And a clear call to action from Ben to our audience to learn more and get involved. So looking at this initiative then um, and mapping to the framework outcomes, we can see here a clear line um, between Ben's work and outcome three, a productive ocean, and outcome seven, an inspiring and engaging ocean. So on to our next speaker. I'm delighted to welcome Mariana to the stage. Mariana is a Ciencia Senior lecture, Lecturer in the School of Biological um, Earth and Environmental Science at the University of New South Wales, and is also one of the co-leaders of the Living Seawalls Project, a flagship project from the Sydney Institute of Marine Sciences. Over to you, Mariana. Thank you very much, Lucy, and thank you very much for inviting me. And I just want to acknowledge that I'm talking today from the traditional land of Gadgal people and would like to pay my respect to elders past, present and future. So did you know that marine artificial structures modify an area of seafloor that is greater than the area of the world's mangrove forest and seagrass beds combined? And with climate change and predicted sea level rise, construction will increase worldwide. We are building more than ever to not only protect our shorelines, but also to support recreation and the much needed blue economy. The problem is that compared to the natural habitats they replace, these artificial structures support reduced biodiversity and consequently provide fewer important services on which we humans rely on, such as fisheries production. This is in part because these structures often have flat surface that provide little protection to marine life. The Living Seawalls has developed a solution for returning marine life to the thousands of kilometers of concrete coastlines worldwide by designing with rather than against nature. The Living Seawalls combine ecological concepts and engineering know-how with artistic design. Our team combines scientists from the Sydney, Sydney Institute of Marine Science with an industrial designer from the Reef Design Lab. Technological advances such as 3D printed have now allowed us to create modular habitat panels that mimic natural features such as rock pools, crevices and ledges and sponge gardens. The complex surface of these panels increase the habitat area for growth of seaweeds, shellfish, and other marine life, and provide shelter from high temperatures and predators, for example. 
These modular panels, they are affordable and can be adapted according to environmental conditions and environmental goals. They can also be incorporated into new constructions or retrofitted into existing structures. Importantly though, living seawalls is driven by science and builds on more than 20 years of research. Our research program has shown that after only two years, living seawalls support at least 36% more fish, seaweeds and invertebrates than unmodified flat seawalls. We have actually found more than 100 species on the living seawall panels. The living seawalls may also improve local water quality by supporting shellfish such as oysters with filter contaminants. Since 2018, we have installed more than 100,000 living seawall panels in Australia and internationally. And we hope that in the next five years, we will have a living seawalls in every continent. This will help increasing the connection of people with the oceans, particularly around urbanized areas where most people live, work, and play. Humans, as you know, have profoundly modified marine ecosystems and coastal constructions forecasted to expand up to 76% in the next 25 years. Therefore, we need to act now. Living seawalls are reviving our oceans by bringing marine life back to coastal developments in the most urbanized places in the world. Our vision is to ensure no new development proceeds without co-design for nature. And we hope that initiatives such as this one as the Ocean Deck of Australia help us to realize this vision. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mariana. What an incredible initiative to not just mitigate impact, but also restore and rehabilitate our marine ecosystems. So let's see how this action maps against the framework. And we can see clearly here alignment with outcome two, a healthy and resilient ocean. And outcome seven, an inspiring and engaging ocean. So for our final speaker today, it's my pleasure to welcome Sam Elson. Sam is the co-founder and CEO of Sea Forest, an innovative environmental biotechnology company developing the scaled cultivation of the red seaweed asparagopsis. Sam is a passionate environmentalist and entrepreneur and is pioneering the development of a new and environmentally positive seaweed aquaculture industry in Australia. Sam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, I'm joining you today from the land of the Muanina people, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which sea forest operates, and uh, I'd like to pay my respect to Tasmanian elders past, present and emerging. Um, sea forest was born out of an urgent need to act decisively around implementing and scaling solutions to climate change. In 2018, myself and Stephen Turner founded the company and began on a path with, with a concept to pioneer the development of a new and environmentally positive industry using seaweed, uh, a particular seaweed, Asparagopsis, to capture carbon and reduce emissions. Asparagopsis is a small red seaweed that's native to Australia and New Zealand and which has a ability to significantly reduce methane emissions when fed as a supplement to ruminant livestock like cows and sheep and, and also results in faster growth. This amazing discovery was from research back in 2016 had one bottleneck and that was that no one in the world knew how to grow it. And so this became our mission. Uh, as an environmentalist with a 20 year career in sustainable fashion, I was aware of the global issue of climate change, but was shocked when in 2017, the IPCC released a report depicting the exponential rate of change we are experiencing and expected to experience as a result of increasing atmospheric concentration of CO2. And looking around, feeling frustrated by the lack of action from industry and governments to make commitments to change behaviours in line with what the report clearly documented as essential in maintaining our way of life on this planet. Right now, 75% of agricultural emissions and 15% of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are from methane. 
from livestock production. Methane has 28 times the warming impact of carbon dioxide. And whilst it doesn't last as long in the atmosphere, its intensity is far greater. Seaweeds, on the other hand, are zero input crops. They don't rely on finite resources like fresh water or inputs such as nutrients or pesticides. And you know, unlike terrestrial farming, seaweeds are immersed in nutrients and the whole organism photosynthesizes. Hence, they can grow up to 30 times faster than land-based plants and in doing so, capture carbon. But seaweed, as we found out, requires an extraordinary amount of science to cultivate. Sea forest is based in the southeast coast of Tasmania in a place where Asparagopsis is annually abundant. We spent the first 18 months of our journey in pure R&D with our team supported by commissioned research at three universities. We made rapid progress and are proud to be right now the very first in the world to have developed methods for land and marine based cultivation of asparagopsis. We have world class facilities and throughout 2021 have been deploying $40 million in capital seeding an 1800 hectare marine lease, one of the largest in the southern hemisphere to scale supply in support of growing demand from industry to access the seaweed and hope to produce 7,000 tonnes of asparagopsis per year when fully established. Since July of 2020, Seaforest has been supplying to its seaweed to the world's first industry trials with Kingston Merino Farm and dairy giant Fonterra, both of whom are expanding trials this coming year. We're also engaged with some of Australia's leading feedlot and pastoral companies that are also looking to access supply. We are absolutely committed to developing employment opportunities and currently employ 44 people in regional Tasmania. For me personally, it's been a steep and rapid learning curve. And whilst Seaforest is a startup making enormous progress and with assets which have the potential to deliver over 80% of, uh, sorry, seaweed to 80% of Australia's feedlot population and abate over 1 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent, we can't do it alone. We, our hope is to facilitate further supply through the licensing of our technology and believe that this native seaweed can create a meaningful reduction in emissions from Australian livestock production. The key takeaway here is that this is an opportunity for Australia ahead of the rest of the world. Seaforest is an environmental biotechnology company using science to address climate change and in doing so is pioneering the development of a new and environmentally positive industry for Australia. It's an unbelievable amount of work, but it's absolutely worth it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. That was absolutely fantastic. And another way that all of our actions knit together across the ocean. Thank you. Um, always with these virtual activities, it's difficult to, to really express our thanks, but please big round of applause to all of our presenters today. That was absolutely fantastic and looking forward to the lively Q&A session at the end of this. Please remember to put your Q&As in the chat. Now, while, we, while I wrap up and before our next session, we're going to pop up that lightning pole. Um, you should see it coming up on your screens shortly. Uh, this is completely anonymous and we're looking for quick fire gut reactions that you may have on the three questions so that we can gauge responses to what you have just heard. While you're doing the poll, um, I will just finish off this session by going through um, how all of our speakers actions um, can be seen to some as a summary to map against the ocean decade framework. Uh, so Sam's, before we do that, we've got Sam's three outcomes and how they contribute to the framework. Outcome two, a healthy and resilient ocean. Outcome three, a productive ocean. And outcome seven, an inspiring and engaging ocean. So in case you hadn't noticed, everyone's slide had different colored uh, post-it notes on it. And so if we just go back to Jazz's opening comments, what we've been trying to illustrate here is how all of our collective actions, initiatives, leadership, and behavior can positively contribute to the Ocean Decade Framework. Uh, these are the three sections of that framework, the objectives, challenges, and outcomes. And so if we summarize all of our speakers across 
those, you can see here how they map beautifully and how we, the collective stakeholders, can contribute. We've got 15 seconds left of the poll, so please get in there and put in your responses. And as always, because this session has been recorded, you can come back to these slides and investigate them um, in more detail after the event. Okay, and here are the results. Thank you very much, everyone, for responding to that. So clear trend here with question one, are you ready to change your behavior? And the overriding response is yes, that's fantastic. Um, and then question two, do we think Australians are ready to change their behavior to achieve a sustainable ocean future? A little bit more mixed there. It looks like yes is have it, but clearly a little bit more that we can do to help influence our fellow Australians. And finally, do you think that you could use the Ocean Decade Framework to think about your work? Um, again, the yeses have it there, but look forward to more feedback in our stakeholder surveys to see how we can help support you in that. Okay, so now I'm delighted to hand over to the next session um, and Juliet, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm actually, as a behavioural scientist, really happy to hear that the majority of people are uh, uh, ready to create change um, and that we think Australians uh, may be there, but there's still room to move. So for the next session, we're going to start to think about what do we know about behaviour and what does it take to bring about behaviour change, uh, particularly for, for many of those Australians. Now, um, we have two uh, fantastic leaders that we're going to speak to, really creating change at complementary levels. The first uh, person that we'll speak with is Terence Jared Ettenham, who is the um, climate change, uh, is a partner in climate change and sustainability at EY and also an environmental engineer. And he will really be speaking to us about how to create behaviour change at the public sector kind of leadership table level. And then we'll hear from Kimberly Norris, who is an associate professor in behavioural psychology at the University of Tasmania. She's also a clinical psychologist and has done a sort of groundbreaking work looking at how people can um, change their behaviour and also kind of maintain their behaviour in really extreme environments. So she's sort of speaking about behaviour change at that individual level. So again, complementary approaches here, this kind of top down approach from Terence to begin and then a bottom up type approach from Kimberly. After that, we will go into a question and answer session where we'll have about 10 minutes for, for some questions. So if you have any along the way, please put them in the um, question and answer chat, and then we'll have a quick poll. So again, um, that's just sort of getting you to reflect on your learnings from this session. So Terence, if I can pass over to you. Right. Thank you, Juliet. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the country that I'm speaking from, uh, the Kulin Nation of the Wurundjeri people, and pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, so just um, in terms of my background, uh, I've spent about 30 years in primarily corporate Australia dealing with environment to begin with and sustainability. Um, and it's really to take corporates um, through the behavior change process, uh, through uh, connecting these issues into strategy uh, and, and moving them along, depending on the drivers uh, that each may face uh, in terms of their own um, sensitive nature of their operations. <clears throat> so if I sort of think about the corporate trajectory back in the 90s, when I started in this area, I think we would have had about 5% of the ASX 100 measuring and reporting just their environmental performance. So um, that would have been companies like Western Mining Corporation uh, and um, BHP Billiton uh, at the time and, and companies like Body Shop um, that had a real purpose and connection to sustainability. So if you then fast forward to 2000s, um, you suddenly had about half of the ASX talking about sustainability, not just environment but also starting to measure and report uh, their performance uh, around sustainable use in the global reporting initiative guidelines. Um, and if you then get into 2010s, uh, the decade that we've just left behind, 
that sort of got to about 75% coverage uh, and about 50% of the two, ASX 200. And if you then move to the current decade, um, you, you, you've got um, the ASX guidance saying you need to report these issues. You need to not only report them, but you need to verify them. Um, you've got the international accounting standards um, talking about coming up with accounting standards for ESG starting with climate change. And so this whole space has evolved. It's evolved slowly, um, but um, the, the, the acceleration uh, over the last five to 10 years is, uh, is quite strong. Um, currently, I guess, if you look at companies, you've got um, a focus on what they call material sustainability issues. So what's material to us as a business? how it connects back into core strategy uh, and connection to purpose uh, are things that we're seeing. Um, shared value is something that companies have talked about. And I guess I'm mentioning these trends because what, what we're finding uh, is that companies are really only focusing on the core sustainable issues that are material to them and material to strategy and the sustainable development goals that are associated with them. Um, so, if, for example, you think about, well, what are the companies that are connected to oceans? You'd immediately think of shipping, ports, you know, fishery, fishing activities and so on that might directly link the living under the ocean SDG to what they do and start to focus on it as a material issue. But then if you sort of look back at some of the mining companies or agri or, or, um, or um, transport companies or property companies, you're unlikely um, to find them linking oceans as a material issue. Um, organizational psychology is important in thinking about behavior change. So what drives them? Um, it, reputation is a huge driver. Um, that they, they, they don't want to be in the press for the wrong reason. Um, they don't want to be hung up individually or as a company and, and brand is really important. So that's a big driver. Uh, regulation increasingly. So we've got regulation around climate, regulation around uh, packaging, whole range of areas that are emerging, uh, modern slavery. These are areas that organizations immediately uh, focus in on. Peer performance is another driver. So if you've got one port having a sustainability strategy, you've suddenly got other CEOs of ports wanting their management teams to develop a sustainability strategy. Employee engagement. So if, if we start to look at the younger population coming through, what we regularly hear is that employees want to work for companies that are doing good, companies that uh, address sustainability issues. Um, investor expectations, um, big driver, every AGM, there's climate questions, sustainability questions, and uh, lots and lots of investors moving in and out of markets depending on um, ESG. Um, I think um, we did a survey last year looking at uh, 400 investors globally and 98% of those investors use ESG information in their decision making. 70% of them use it in a very structured methodical way. Uh, litigation and director duties are the drivers. So that we've got climate litigation, we've got um, director duties such as the Noel Hutley opinion talking about uh, directors needing to look at climate as a risk and, and, and um, provide stewardship over it. Otherwise, um, they may be um, subject to litigation. Um, and then risk management, cost management, customer retention, and market share retention are all areas of focus and drivers for ESG. Um, finally, it's worth mentioning that increasingly we're seeing executive REM being linked to uh, ESG performance. And, and that uh, would be a, a clear link to executives really taking ownership of part or all of the sustainability strategy. The other thing that's worth mentioning is business models. So we've got, I guess, within the market, there's business models that are highly impacting on climate and ocean and other areas. Uh, and then you've got purpose-led business models at the other end that are set up to, um, such as some of the businesses that we just heard from, set up to address 
some of these issues and create a solution and therefore a business. And, and you know, if we look at Tesla as an example, it, it, it's a clear example of one that's sort of t- uh, gone for global dominance in a very short t- time frame, addressing the issue of, uh, of emissions. Um, so if, if I look at, you know, yes, the purpose-led businesses can move really quickly. The other sectors are moving along and they've got lots of drivers. Um, and, and then there's a whole mass, I think, in between that I don't think connect oceans and their operations. Um, and so that that's potentially the area that, um, you know, this community needs to focus in on. Um, you know, if, if we look at, for example, farmers um, and agri or dairy, you know, would they immediately see the connection to ocean? Would they see that we're in what we call the Anthropocene, where nitrogen, phosphorus cycles, and climate uh, have all overshot? Um, that if you look at land-based biomass, um, 36% are human biomass and 60% are domesticated animals. There's only 4% wild animals. Are, are these issues apparent to these sectors? So we, we just did a report uh, for Farmers for Climate Action, which um, we, you know, we found that um, uh, farmers in Australia can get to net zero um, by 2040. Uh, uh, with the types of solutions that we've talked about here in terms of reducing greenhouse, um, greenhouse gases from um, the, the uh, food that they intake. Um, so th- they're, they're the sort of challenges, I think, for, for business in terms of connecting to ocean. Uh, and without that connection, it's hard to then get them to change behavior around um, that their business practices and how how they can improve it in order to have a less negative and more positive um, impact on the environment. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Um, I think that was fantastic, just thinking about some of those drivers of change in terms of attracting employees, the, the KPIs or, or bonuses li- linked to the ESG goals. Um, Thinking about readiness for change and considering particularly if people are approaching um, businesses, whether or not they're ready for change in terms of purpose-led or not. And really the thinking about the farmers and um, I mean, well, actually not the farmers, your farmer example, the connection and collaboration as a key aspect there, which I'm not going to steal jazz is thunder but what she'll talk about later is uh, you know part of this is is bringing in uh, people together from a range of different industries to collaborate uh so kimberly i'm gonna let you now speak about the individual level lovely thank you juliet and thank you to everyone here i'm privileged to be joined on the lands of the palawa and the milanina people So much of what has been covered today by Terence, by some of the earlier pictures, by some of the organisers of this particular event really speaks to this issue of change. The reason many of you have joined together here as part of this session is because you have a very strong motivation or at least recognition of the importance of change when it comes to the ocean decade, when it comes to climate change more generally. And so as a psychological scientist, as a clinical psychologist, often people come to me with those questions of, I'm ready for change, how do I do it? Or why won't other people change? And so when we think about this idea of change, we need to recognise that what we've been able to demonstrate through research is that people actually exist along this continuum of change. So it's not you're ready or you're not ready. We actually move through a series of processes that gradually increase our awareness, readiness, and then basically our preparedness for change. So one of the main frameworks we often refer to is called the trans-theoretical model of change. Fancy words, but essentially what it means is that you move through stages of change. And the way we pitch information, 
the expectations we have of ourselves and of other people actually need to be tailored to that person or as Terence was describing a moment ago, that organisation's stage of change. And so I will speak about those stages of change in a moment. But what's important to remember is that if we have a mismatch between a person, a group, an organisation's readiness for change and the demands for change that are being placed on them, what's actually very likely to happen is a polarisation. So if anything, change is less likely to happen because of that lack of alignment. So when we start thinking about how we can facilitate change, first and foremost, we need to make sure that we're pitching it at the right level for the right group at the right time. So at the very, very early stages, we have this stage of change called pre-contemplation. And essentially, these are individuals, organisations, groups who really haven't considered, maybe even haven't recognised a need for change. And so if we come at those individuals saying, you need to do this, you must do that, what's really going to happen is that those people are going to dig their heels in pretty hard because you're essentially asking them to turn the world upside down for a reason either they aren't aware of or that they don't agree with. And so essentially your message, rather than being one of motivation, becomes a message of threat. And when people feel under threat, then they tend to withdraw or they tend to react with anger or opposite action. So that pre-contemplation stage, if we're going to engage people, it's really about awareness raising rather than behaviour change. After the pre-contemplation stage is this idea of contemplation. So there's, there's an awareness. There's an awareness that there is an issue that needs to be addressed. But the individual, the group, the organisation haven't really taken on board that it's their responsibility at this time, or at least not their sole responsibility. So people in that contemplation stage really need to have a sense of belonging and identity. So whereas with the pre-contemplation, we're trying to increase awareness, create a space for discussion, in the contemplation stage, we're trying to have that sense of you are one of us, you belong here, you're part of our community. Because when we are part of the community, we are much more likely to align our behaviours with the dominant group because we're social beings. That, that's a sense of safety. The next stage is the planning preparation stage. In other words, we recognise there's an issue, we recognise we have a role, now we're figuring out what that role might actually look like. And so for so those individuals in that planning or preparation stage, our messages and our behavioural expectations are much more about how can we support you to enact this change. So again, that sense of belonging, but also we're mobilising now. We're actually moving towards action. There's planning, there's preparation, essentially a commitment. The next stage is action. And this is a part that most people here will have experienced already or be in the midst of the doing phase. And to date, most of the messaging, most of the strategizing, most of the campaigns have been pitched at this action stage when we're actively making change. And it's a really exciting stage. And when you're in that and you're getting that feedback and that awareness that difference is occurring, change is occurring, it's very, very motivating. So for individuals in this particular stage of change, it is very much about where to from here, where to next, how can we build upon what's already occurring. The final stage of change is one that often gets forgotten. And it's about what we call maintenance. In other words, how do people keep doing the good things they're doing so that it's not a bit of a flash in the pan, so that it's not 
the excitement of the action stage, but then we go back to business as usual. The maintenance stage is about keeping those good behavioural changes, awareness going, so that each time there is a next, next form of action, we're going further above, we're going further above, we're going further above. And again, for individuals in the maintenance stage, the motivation is still there, although sometimes there can be a loss of hope if they look around and feel that they're the only ones making an effort. So that sense of connection, that sense of a social network, and, and what's already been touched on today and will be drawn on again later in some of the conversations, is that we need to recognise a systems approach. Yes, there are individuals. Those individuals are part of social networks. Networks will incorporate organisations. Those organisations are part of societal structures which are influenced by political landscapes. And so concurrently, we have all these different driving forces. So the other thing we have to remember, and this again has been touched on by a few people, is when people's motivation is a little bit lower, when they're feeling a bit worn out, we need to recognise that intrinsic motivation, that internal drive to achieve more, to address these risks to the ocean, to the climate more generally, that, that can wait for a bit. So we need to have extrinsic motivators as well, so outside support, outside motivators. And what the research is really clear on is that people like getting good things. So if there is some form of incentive to support positive behavioural change, people are much more likely to comply or at least join part of that. And at the same time, people don't like bad things. So if you incentivize or reward good behavior and through that good behavior, you simultaneously take away negative things. So you avoid fines, you avoid bad public, all of those aspects, you create this environment in which both extrinsic motivators, so that reward and avoided punishment, aligns with intrinsic values and motivators, what's important to me, to our business model, to my family, to my place in the world, that sustainability suddenly becomes much, much easier to occur. So it is about understanding that the reason we haven't found the answer yet is because it's not one single answer. We need to recognise that there are bottom-up processes, top-down processes, sideways processes, and that these are constantly changing. The really exciting thing, though, is that what the research shows is when people are part of change that results in a positive outcome, not just for themselves, but more broadly, we actually see a flourishing of human health and wellbeing. So suddenly if we can start to integrate this and recognise that ocean health is intrinsically linked to human health and all its dimensions, that is when we're really going to see that mobilisation of behaviour change. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick rapid fire questions for, for both of you. First of all, Kimberly, I think uh, providing an individual framework of change is fantastic. So as an organisational leader or individual, actually being able to direct, uh, thinking about your end users or, or policymakers even, right, being able to direct people to um, where they might want to begin is fantastic and I think really complements Terence's approach of thinking about how you also uh, think about the business models and, and, and using your approach there. Uh, also, you, you spoke really um, uh, fantastically about some of the drivers and thinking about those intrinsic drivers. So similar to Terence in terms of, you know, people's purpose and the extrinsic drivers in, in thinking, you know, um, even about uh, rewards or punishments. Uh, but one thing that I'd, I'd like to think about is as behavioural scientists or, you know, um, we know that you don't always need to change people's 
um, perceptions along the way. But what we really want to do in this case is build trust in science. So if I can ask both of you to give really quick, short answers around, you know, um, how do you build the trust in science from your different perspectives? Or how do you help people trust science, whether that's the leaders, Terence or, or Kimberly? So let's start maybe with uh, Kimberly. Such an important question, trying to succinctly respond. One of the challenges we have with science is that for those who haven't had the privilege of a scientific education, sometimes it, there can be a misunderstanding that new results or different results means the science is wrong or means that the scientists don't know what they're doing. So I think if we can do more to help people understand that if you have new data or if the data looks different, that actually adds to the picture and adds to our understanding rather than detracts from it. I think that will go a very long way to increase trust in science and science messaging. Um, from a, sorry. Go no, please. Um, I, I, I think from an organisational point of view, I guess I was reflecting just seeing a um, ABC ping coming through saying Australia's committed to net zero 2050. Um, that it has taken a fair while for politicians to accept the science. Uh, so we, we've, you know, gone from taking a piece of coal into the parliament to committing to net zero while probably being uh, pulled and pushed to commit to net zero. Uh, and I, and I, I guess what I'm finding with, within organisations is that because of that lack of leadership that we've had at the political level, it's it's been um, I think a little bit challenging to get everyone on the same page. So uh, when I look at executives or board engagement, uh, I um, definitely take a scientific approach and ideally bring an IPCC scientist in who can speak to the science uh, eloquently and and in detail and answer any questions around it in order to get everyone on the same page. And I think within organisations, if everyone's not on the same page, as we've found with, I think, Australian politics, um, we, we're not going to get the movement. Fantastic. And how do you get people on the same page when you say that? What are some tips or strategies that you could, you've used previously? Um, I, I think stress testing the science collectively. Um, uh, when, when I think uh, people see... Uh, others in the room that might be accepting of the science, others in the room that might be championing it, uh, and then having some questions or, or, or non-believers, uh, I think stress testing it uh, with an expert in the room is a really good way of, um, you know, uh, um, I guess, getting everyone on the same page. Uh, we run a program with the Cambridge University called the Cambridge Programme for Sustainable Leadership with about 40 executives a year at the Werribee Mansion. And we had someone from the dairy sector after that, it's a three day program, after the first day of science, basically shut himself into a room and did not come out for a second day because he just wasn't aware of all of the science and uh, got into this state of uh, depression. And so that, that, that's the sort of, uh, sort of extreme um, uh, effects that you get. Yeah. I as a behavioural scientist, I, I love the idea of stress testing or even experimenting yourself. So actually having that ability and that flexibility mindset to say, let's test some of these solutions and see how they go. Um, considering this is an ocean decade event, um, in 10 words or less, here's the challenge. I'd like to, you to, to just share a piece of advice uh, for the audience about what you've learned in the ability to create behaviour change. So if you could give them one piece of advice to shift behaviour, what would that be? Uh, Terence, we'll start with you this time. Sure. Uh, I, I think um, you can't manage what you measure, so I'm a big proponent of measuring, big proponent of focusing on reputation and executive accountability uh, for managing the issues. I think the final bit is just, just to be able to link oceans better to a lot of the industries that we find in Australia. Fantastic. And Kimberly? Um, I'm trying to be as eloquent as Terence was. Essentially, I think, particularly from a research perspective and particularly for people who are in this space, we often talk about being the change you want to see. The other part of that 
is seeing the change when it occurs. It's really important to recognise when change is occurring and have that community of support because that will help you weather those more challenging times and, and those senses of threat or, or being attacked by others who perhaps aren't aligned with those more ocean relevant and protective behaviours. Fantastic. Um, look, I think you're actually creating a great segue now into the next session, which is will be a panel discussion, uh, because what you can see, so before we'll have a poll, but um, what you can see is, you know, um, through the panel uh, that you heard from before, there's measurement in there, there is actually, you know, linking the science across different industries and communities, there's gaining the leadership buy-in, um, and there's also, you know, thinking about that, that feedback and, and being able to measure that change. So that's a perfect segue into the next session, but before we do again we're just going to have a really quick poll so thank you very much Terence and Kimberly that was fantastic thanks Julia now now we're going into the poll so everybody you've just got two minutes to answer the poll should be in front of you now Okay, so the results are in and what you can see is where are you on the change spectrum? So most people are at the action and making change. I mean, by virtue of being here, that, that likely makes a sense. But there's a few people there in the in the maintenance space as well. Preparation or contemplation, um, fantastic. Hopefully this event will shift you more into the, the action phase and a few in the pre-contemplation uh, stage as well. Uh, in terms of where is your workplace or organisation in creating the change spectrum, uh, you can see that most people are creating the action and making change, which is um, fantastic news. We've still got um, a, a majority there, you know, starting or contemplating, um, some in the maintenance phase, uh, and as well, a few people that, uh, you know, might not be relevant, uh, so to speak. And the last one is, do you, oh, sorry, second last one is, uh, do you reference scientific information to explain the need for change? And the majority of you do. Some say no, uh, and some say sometimes. So um, let's yeah, hope that we continue to push down the, the yes spectrum, but it can be complex. So um, yeah, interesting kind of results there as well. And then the last one is, do you think your organisation is motiv motivating change? And most of you are saying yes, by, probably by virtue of being in that action. But that's absolutely fantastic uh, to, to hear. So now we are going to go into the uh, panel discussion. So I'm going to ask the panellists to turn uh, back on their uh, their videos. Uh, and what we're really now going to open up as this session is for you as the audience to ask some questions as well as I'm sort of going to ask a few uh, behaviour change type questions. So one of the first questions that um, I'm going to ask while we, we start to load some of the questions is really for uh, Sam and Alex. And this question is just uh, thinking about if there are individuals out there or audience members uh, thinking about starting something, how did you take or do you take your idea from a, a seeding idea right through to reality? What are some really quick behavioural strategies that you might have there? So let's start with Alex first and then we'll move to Sam. Thanks, Julia. Interesting question. Um, and just looking back at Kimberly's framework, which I think is uh, a great tool to frame this, at the moment we're still very much in that awareness building stage. Um, you know, being uh, sort of uh, an industry-based cluster, if you like, you start with no money. And so you have to build traction, you have to build partnerships, and you have to actually reach out and, and make all of your stakeholders in the community aware of what you're doing. 
that's probably the limiting factor uh, for ocean energy at the moment. There are some, um, there are some false uh, perceptions, but mainly it's just a lack of awareness. And so what we're hoping to create is, is something uh, that makes that accessible, where people can learn, I say people, uh, stakeholders, energy markets, they can learn about the benefits of uh, combining ocean energy into a renewables section. And through that, start to get some community traction. Um, through that community traction, then we hope to get the, uh, the decision makers starting to lean towards uh, creating policy that's gonna facilitate the sector moving forward. And so it, at times it, you know, that, that stage, that action stage and the, uh, the end of the road prize is way over the horizon. And we just have to really keep concentrating on, on that focus and make it accessible, build that awareness and help, uh, I guess, uh, dispel some of the misconceptions about affordability by highlighting the benefits of the integration of wave and tidal energy. Fantastic. And Sam? Yeah, for me, Juliet, is it's really around, um, you know, gearing yourself or tooling yourself with as much information as possible. So going deep on the research and really understanding what it is, the solution that you're hoping to drive, and then surrounding yourself with, you know, experts, which has been, I think, part of CFOR's success to date is having, you know, commissioned research at three universities, as well as a, a world leading scientific team, um, without, without which we would not have made so much progress. So certainly there's a lot of drive and determination, but then it's the, you know, there's a hell of a lot of research and then perseverance and resilience as we talk about. Yeah, fantastic. And um, there was an audience question for you thinking about, um, do you think that the average Joe or the average farmer that will be able to use your product? Yeah, absolutely. That is that is one hundred percent our hope. So we you know we are building up supply at the moment, and we are taking inquiries through our website. Um, we are working with and talking to many of Australia's leading feedlot and dairy producers, and uh, but are, but are taking inquiries from from everybody in Australia. Fantastic. So now we're going to move on to um, thinking about communicating the science behind. Uh, behind uh, at your, your innovations and, and your work. And so here I thought really, Erin and Mariana, you could really uh, discuss what are the lessons you've learned about communicating the science to a range of different stakeholders? Uh, I can take that one first if you like. So I, I think um, it's really interesting and, and just touching on, on what both speakers have said around having that scientific database because something in the case of an offshore wind farm, people look at that and say, well, Australia is a big country. Um, we've got lots of land. Why can't we just do that? It seems a lot easier and cheaper than going out into the ocean and building these turbines. Why would we do that? So we do rely on the data, but as we know, when that comes through in a scientific way, it can become very difficult for people to understand. So it's why we've invested quite significantly in building relationships. I know there was a, a question in the Q&A here around rather than it just being science-based, how can we make it a values-based conversation? So understanding what is it that interests those particular stakeholders and what they're trying to achieve, whether that's a local person in Gippsland who's interested in their future community and what their uh, economy might look like, or if it is someone, um, a policymaker in government who's grappling with some of the challenges of the day. So ensuring that uh, you're establishing those connections, those relationships, and making the information fit for purpose for the one that you're talking to. So it's a it's a really strong focus of our team, and I encourage that for anyone who is trying a new venture is to think about that um, targeted approach and, and not so transactional. I think sometimes when we deal with stakeholders, it becomes transactional uh, rather than relationship-based, which is more fruitful in general. Hi. Yes, I, I agree. I think building relationships is essential. And actually, there are lots of science showing that if you don't have the support of different stakeholders, any restoration or rehabilitation program, it's, it's hardly going to be successful. Right. So with the living seawalls, first, we realized that people were not even aware of the issue. Uh, so it was uh, like um, a matter of raising the problem and, and making people aware of the problem happen. People think in terms of urbanization, they think of cities, they think of land, they hardly think of the problems that causes in the ocean. And then it's a matter of 
these are places that we deal with highly urbanized areas where people work, where people live. So, you know, like aesthetics, for example, is super important. Um, we had to consider uh, how panels, for example, would affect the integrity of seawalls, whether they would accumulate garbage, all those uh, questions that people have, they are super valid and we need to be able to address them. Otherwise, people won't embrace the, the project that you want to do and, and behavior won't happen and action won't happen. So I think it's crucial to have that. Yeah, I think you've both made some fantastic points there, right? It's not just about communicating the science and saying these are the statistics, this is what's happening, you know, on a global level, but actually thinking about linking the science to value. So, so also communicating the value to a variety of different stakeholders. So what scientists find valuable might be very different from what leaders find valuable um, and likely and, and what individuals like who are using the seawalls uh, find, find valuable. So how do you a, communicate not only the science, but the value? And if you can link those together, then there's um, additional benefit there. So thank you for that. Now I want to sort of move on to uh, thinking about successful ways or learnings around creating the change. Um, and here I really want to, would like to kind of hear, I guess, think from Martin and, and Heidi around kind of, you know, how have you thought about change both Martin at that leadership level, but Haiti also, I, I think with what you're talking about before with the cigarette butts, it's a fantastic way of thinking about kind of shifting the environment, not always just focusing on um, an, an individual, but rather how do you reshape the environment to then uh, create change. So uh, Haiti, we'll start with you and then um, we'll sort of kind of bottom up. And then again, um, Martin will move to you for that kind of top down approach. Thanks, Julia. I think that one of the biggest learnings for me was that everybody has different drivers. So my driver is about an environmental outcome. You know, I love being in the ocean. I was a diving instructor. I made my living out of the ocean. I love to spend my time in the ocean. Um, but not everybody is either able to make business decisions based on um, the environment or cares about turtles. So what, what is the driver that still gets us to that same point? Um, and in some cases, um, you know, it, it's a different outcome. Probably a better example is the Operation Clean Sweep program that we're running for the plastics industry. It's about reducing plastic resin pellet loss during manufacturing and transport. And to get that across the line through, you know, CEOs in the industry, it was talking about occupational health and safety, um, you know, benefits and, and not losing a resource that they were buying, um, you know, and not getting fined by the EPA as opposed to the driver for me, which was an environmental outcome. So I think we just need to be really conscious that everybody makes decisions for different reasons. And if they don't align with your reason, then find another way uh, to get them to that same end point. Yeah, that was great. I'd, I'd just like to say what she said. Um, I think the, the key is that uh, for me, uh, it is all about that alignment. It is all about people at the end of the day. And so you first need to develop the trust amongst the groups. You've got to, once you get that trust happening, then you can actually have proper constructive dialogue. And by constructive dialogue, that's where you get to call bullshit. It's like somebody says something to you, say, well, actually, no, I think that's wrong. And that's a real challenge in our society. So you need the trust first. Once you get over that, then you can start collaborating and, and uh <clears throat> I do like holding everyone accountable uh, because once you've got that collaboration, then each of you can hold the other accountable for generating what inevitably is becoming results. And um, I have a very simple uh, mind and way of thinking of things, which is, you know, get alignment. Where do you want to get to? So once everyone's keyed in on the same vision, then you can look at, well, where are we now? And then you can use science to inform. And I like that comment about science and values, but science can inform how do you get from where you are now to where you really all want to be. And um, that you're going to have different pathways to get there. But as long as you're all really clear that's where we want to be, you'll get there. So, Martin, a question for you then is, um, I, are you speaking, how do you, how do you get alignment from the the supply chain and the customers to support that vision um, in addition to then the, the, the leadership uh, table in which we were speaking or the CEOs that you were just speaking about? 
Yeah, that was a great question from Kat. It's, that is actually super difficult because what happens is you'll get three quarters of the, uh, the value chain will move in a particular direction, but all you need is for one aspect to actually say, well, no, we're going to go somewhere else. Um, so I'm producing the cheapest, um, most sustainable seafood ever, uh, but Joan Ert comes along and says, well, no, actually, uh, we'll sell that to you for just a couple of cents a kilo cheaper. And unless the retailer is actually aligned with what is happening everywhere else, all that happens is you dissipate all that energy. So having that alignment's really key. And um, we've been working through roundtables with groups like um, Sustainable Fisheries Partnerships and um, loads of opportunities to bring everyone along together, but also working with governments because you have to have regulation that moves with the industry and with the transformation that's happening so that you raise that bar because otherwise what happens is um, uh, the bad people get, keep getting away doing the bad things and the good people feel all altruistic but go broke. And so we need to find a balance between aspiration, commercial reality and all work together. Fantastic. I think you brought up a, a really interesting point here around governments. And um, Ben, I'm getting to you with a question too, but I think this could be a question for the panel for, for whoever uh, feels that they could answer this. And this is, have you, yeah, has anybody experienced serious roadblocks um, because of government? And how did you get through that? What were the compromises that you made? Um, I'm happy um, to start. Yeah, we, you can start, Martin. <laughs> Uh, uh, well, a uh, serious roadblock would be uh, governance collapsing at an international level. Um, North Atlantic Pelagics is a really classic one where the fish stocks ended up being uh, fished unsustainably because European governments couldn't agree on catch limits amongst themselves. And so the barrier was how do we get those governments to actually change their behaviours and act responsibly? And uh, that's still a work in progress. But what we're doing is using the leverage of not just CBOS, but all of the aligned companies that are involved in that fishery to try and pressure governments to actually act responsibly. Sorry, over to you, Mariana. Um, no, I think my internet is a bit bad. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, sorry. Um, I think our main, what we, uh, experienced a lot in, in the living sea walls is actually like ownership who owns the who owns the sea walls because at the high tide someone else at the low tide is commonwealth waters then it's council then so there is not a policy adequate policy uh, to actually support some of these initiatives so sometimes it's actually easier Probably it's easier to build a coal mine in Australia than it's actually to put living seawalls in some places. So it's, I think we lack a lot of policy uh, that allow some of these initiatives going on. And we definitely have had a lot of um, delays because of that. So we have managed to, to overcome a lot of that through some of our, what we call our champions. We find the councils and uh, that really supportive and then they, they deal with it in a way that then other councils are like, okay, we can then do that in that way. But it, it was crucial for us to find kind of that champion and that local council to actually start some of some of the programs. Fantastic. And Alex and Ben, I'd love to hear from you both as well uh, in this case, because I feel that you're really focused on that government level at this stage. So Ben, would you sort of like to comment on your interactions with any roadblocks that you've had with government or even just in general businesses or community? Uh, thanks very much, Juliet. A, a bit of a personal reflection here. So I'm, I'm a repat back to the Australian context. So I've spent the vast majority of my career internationally and then come back uh, conveniently just before the pandemic back to Sydney. Um, and one of the things that really struck me in the Australian context as a, as a newcomer to it uh, in comparison to many other locations is 
is the adversarial nature of many discussions around um, environmental issues in general and the de-emphasis on what I would describe as the opportunity space or the asset value of the environment. So you get public debates about, well, regulation versus development or conservation versus development. And there's always an adversarial element in the middle. And if you contrast that to um, a lot of countries, well, a growing number of countries in Europe, but also in particular leadership in, in the sort of emerging economy space, where sustainability and a driver of value are seen much more in alignment with one another. And so in my experience, those kinds of framings can be really instrumental in how, how partnerships between government and the private sector evolve because it enables conversations where there are champions on both sides um, that enable a grounding basis to move forward. And there, there are also lots of really practical informational roadblocks um, everyone in a big institution, whether it's you know, public sector or private sector, is, is trying to achieve certain outcomes. And if, if those outcomes are not sufficiently holistic, then you're going to get bad results. And even at, in this space, and this is where the Global Ocean Accounts Partnership really was a demand-driven initiative rather than a, um, a, it was very reactive by design actually, rather than something that was really pushed and advocated for. And it was a response to, I guess, very high level political pressure to say, we want to do something about valuing nature and decision-making, but we need to know the how. So in that case, there was no roadblock at the awareness level. And if you look at ocean economy processes internationally, there's very high political awareness of the combination of large economic development opportunity, but critical sustainability challenge. So the question becomes, um, not not we're opposed how do we do this it becomes well we desperately want to do it but we need we need experts and others to work together to come up with a solution and that involves i guess atypical collaborations outside of silos that can sometimes be very challenging so i i'd, I'd be tempted at risk of not answering your question i'd be tempted to reframe it a little bit as it's about creating shared opportunity space rather than running over roadblocks, recognizing that there are champions of forward momentum in every sector. That battle has largely been won at the macro level, I would suggest. Um, but it's a question of how we actually, how the, to use a terrestrial analogy, how the rubber meets the road on, on many of these issues. Thanks. Yeah, look, I think that echoes what was previously discussed around values. Um, and, and Terence, you also spoke about kind of finding uh, champions of change in a previous conversation that we've had. So finding those people that align that might be either speaking, um, using different uh, languages to, to build or, or you know, that, that still want to achieve the same goal, but actually crafting that in the right way. And Alex, can I now pass to you? Yeah, Juliet, uh, and I might be speaking for uh, Aaron in this discussion. And Aaron, pull me up if I get it wrong. But um, one of the most limiting factors for uh, offshore energy production from our oceans have been that lack of policy framework. Uh, and until very recently, and in fact today, I think Aaron mentioned that um, the offshore uh, electricity infrastructure bill is being debated in Senate. Until that time, uh, investment wasn't really flowing into Australia because the, the rule book for uh, how offshore energy could be produced wasn't created yet. And I thought this was a uniquely Australian problem, but talking to my colleagues overseas, uh, it really the European community and the rest of the world is looking at Australia as the the first one to develop specific legislation on offshore energy. Um, and the, the feeling is that once that legislation gets through the parliament, that the investment will start to flow and that will open things up for further collaboration and partnerships really between wind, wave, tidal energy and, and to strengthen uh, the future planning for that. Um, Andrew Sullivan raises an important point in the, in the discussion here about spatial planning. And again, the, the space has been very fragmented. You've got fishing, uh, aquaculture, offshore oil and gas, offshore energy, all sort of working in the same space without a cohesive planning framework. Um, and it's really important that we start to look at that planning holistically and incorporate new things like uh, ocean energy production centers or areas or zones and how to do that 
without uh, negatively influencing the fishing sector or the aquaculture sector, which is also you know, moving offshore into deeper waters. So this bit of legislation uh, can be the starting point to start um, those water planning discussions and uh, see some good things happening. Fantastic. I hear a greater need for collaboration like the Ocean Decade events brings everybody together. Um, look, I'm going to now finish with a, a, a resilience question. So we focused a lot on how a, a, an organisational level, um, we can create change and an individual level, we can create change. But really, um, part of that can be behaviour change is difficult. There can be roadblocks at many different aspects. So um, I'm going to ask the full panel to answer this uh, one at a time in 10 words or less. But how have you stayed resilient through creating when you've been creating your change and, and leading in this area? So I'm going to go through who's first on my screen. Alex, would you like to start? Be authentic. Build strong, trusting partnerships. And keep a focus on important outcomes. Fantastic. Strong, strong partnerships and focus on important outcomes. Trust. Keyword. Trust. Name. Trust. Heidi. Um, mine I've been using for a while, which is be consistent, be persistent, and do it with a smile. Consistent, <laughs> persistent, do it with a smile. I like that. Martin. Uh, yeah, I, I like to seek first to understand, respect others, and meditate. Yes, eat, so seek stop first. and breathe. Yeah, fantastic. Eat, stop, and breathe. Did you say? Yeah, seek, <laughs> eat, stop, and breathe. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Seek, seek stop. first to understand. So understand others, respect others, but I meditate to uh, stay sane along the way. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Sam. I guess just reminding ourselves that it's not about us. Yeah, you know, this is about future generations. Um, so, so, you know, individually when we think about that, I think it's very powerful. Yes, so thinking about the future, fantastic in future generations. Mariana. I try to, to keep, I'm optimistic. So I, I do think, I hope, and, and as Sam said, like I do have two kids, so I do focus on them a lot. And I have to admit that wine helps. <laughs> yes, wine and positive thinking. <laughs> Fantastic. Ben. Oh, you're just on mute. Uh, ben, you're just on mute. I mean, that's probably for the best. I was saying I'm not sure I can follow the, the powerful uh, motivators from Sam and Mariana, but uh, also turn off emails they'll still be there some, tomorrow turn off emails fantastic uh erin yeah for me it's three main words which is appreciate celebrate and grow on the journey on your own and just recognize sometimes you win sometimes you learn fantastic so appreciate celebrate and grow sometimes you win and sometimes you learn and i'm also going to add um, kimberly and terence into this so kimberly I adopt the three new R's, which is rest, relax, and recover. You can only give out energy that you've already put in. Fantastic. So the three R's, we'll remember that. And then Terence. Right, thanks, Julia. Um, so I, I, I think every action has an opposite reaction. And, and so there's been a lot of negative issues happen at least of my working career in the, in the sustainability and climate area and i think uh, i've started to look at every negative thing as a positive um, and and if donald trump gets elected well he'll uh, lose power and so on and so forth so just to start to think about uh, that sort of scenario where there might be something negative but it's going to turn into a positive you find it you tease it tease it out and shine a light on it and and work towards that outcome and, and to Martin's point and, and Kimberly's point about resting and meditation, I, I, I prefer to I, I do those, but I, I like to be super fit so that I can fight that battle. 
Fantastic. So that's, you know, awesome. It's just, again, reframing your thinking in a more optimistic way and finding outlets to recuperate yourself, which is a phenomenal. Okay, so we're going to need to wrap it up there and I'm going to pass it over to, to Jazz just to talk about where to next. But I'd just like to thank every all of the panel for your fantastic insights. As a behavioural scientist, you know, we think about the, the core ways to create that kind of sustain our sustainable goals is to think about the, the public facing um, sector, so citizens and, and customers, the policy makers and the private sector itself. And I think you've all done a fantastic job of really uh, elaborating on how to create that change across those different levels. So thank you. I have been inspired over the last few weeks listening to you and, and particularly today. And well, thank you, everyone. Please join me in a virtual round of thundering applause for all of our pitches and keynote speakers. Absolutely amazing um, to listen to everyone and incredibly inspiring. When we began this initiative earlier this year, we wanted to include stakeholders in a discussion about the ocean that went beyond the important but obvious stakeholders in government and research. What we have found is that Australia's ocean stakeholders are very many, very diverse, um, fragmented, and sometimes people didn't initially see themselves or their organisations as ocean stakeholders. And to Terence's point earlier, how do we go about shifting that understanding and, and moving that into the narrative? Over the course of the last year, I've had hundreds of conversations with people and often when I speak to business leaders they are not talking um, to me about their organisation as an ocean stakeholder they're often often trying to give me a list of people who they know who work in or on the ocean so we do need to start shifting that narrative for people to understand that. In the course of our work, we discovered that we were in fact pulling together and connecting ocean stakeholders. And we could not have found a comprehensive list of stakeholders at the beginning of this year. So here it is with a massive disclaimer. We recognise this slide is incomplete and it will and should change. And we will continue iterating this list. Down the bottom is an invitation to anyone to tell us if someone is missing um, off, this, uh, off this slide here and we'll be adding them in. Ocean stakeholders have told us that the most valuable and useful role we can play is in connecting them. And as you're aware, this is our third briefing, but in addition to this, we've conducted over 300 interviews, a range of surveys and reported on the findings of those surveys. We're working to connect up the variety of ocean initiatives that are active in Australia over here, the high level panel, um, which has been mentioned a couple of times, the National Marine Science Plan and the National Oceans and Coast Strategy. What that tells us is that there's a lot of interest and there's acknowledgement that there is a, a lot of opportunity and you've heard that from our speakers today. We've also, a point on culture, we've also talked a lot about human behaviour today. Ocean Decade Australia is about inclusivity that goes beyond the norm. We're here to listen and to build platforms for work to be heard. So we're not here to duplicate anything that's already happening. We just want to amplify what's going on. I love that also that um, note that you had in there, Martin, around disagreeing well, and also Ben, your experience of coming back to Australia. That is something that culturally we need to get more used to. It would be remiss if we didn't bring to your attention the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy, often referred to simply as the Ocean Panel. Australia is a member of the Ocean Panel and our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, sits on it with leaders from 13 other nations, including Canada, Fiji, Indonesia, Norway and Japan. I believe France is joining also. These nations represent highly diverse oceanic economic and political perspectives and are working together to agree a series of commitments towards a sustainable ocean economy. These five themes that you can see on the screen here are areas identified for transformation and they align well with the Ocean Decade framework that we walked you through as part of this. Key amongst the commitments Australia has made is one to deliver a sustainable ocean plan or a SOP by 2025. That's a significant commitment and we're really galvanised by what this could mean for our nation and Australia's ocean stakeholders. 
our next steps are to continue to work as connectors. Our plans include providing updates and ampl amplification of Australian work. We will continue to track Australia's contributions to the ocean decade and stakeholder attitudes to the ocean. There's more to come on that work in future. We are building advisory and providing advisory services around the Ocean Decade framework, as you've seen today, and guidance regarding endorsement of Ocean Decade actions. In November, my incredible colleague, Karen Evans, will be working to host webinars on how to prepare actions for endorsement, and we will include details on how to sign up for those after this event. Finally, we will continue to make use of our growing ocean stakeholder database. There's over 1,600 people on that database right now, and we are regularly contacted for recommendations on speakers and expertise. We are also in the early stage, stages of planning for the Ocean Business Leaders Summit in 2022. We emphasise that Ocean Decade Australia is an entirely voluntary initiative. Everyone who's been involved as a speaker, facilitator, venue host, data cruncher and event organiser has volunteered their time and we must thank the incredible range of contributors for their efforts today. We think it's a great lesson that when you build platforms, generosity does flow. So thank you to all of those people. Today, I've been the one up here on the stage, but I want to call up my co-founders, Kim and Karen, um, as well, if they can turn on their cameras, please, so that you can see us all in, uh, well, in virtual uh, land. And there they are, hi guys. Um, we've delighted in bringing together our variety of experiences, skills and expertise in service to our client, which is the ocean. We've spent a really remarkable year creating this initiative together. Speaking personally, my own resilience has been buoyed by the intellectual debate, the shared curiosity and the challenge of my own ideas by these two scientists, collaborators and now really good friends. We hope you've seen the opportunities for partnership and collaboration through our pitches and our behaviour experts. Finally, we encourage you to stay in touch with us and join our movement to get the new Blue Deal our ocean deserves. Thank you.